The Autobiography of George Miller, Chapter 4, Part 2, picking up on 1835. January 1st, we had last evening a special prayer meeting of the two churches, and any other persons that chose to attend for the sake of praising the Lord for all his many mercies, which we have received during the past year, and to ask him to continue to us his favor during this year also. It was open to any of the brethren to pray, as they felt disposed, and 18 did so. We continued in prayer and praise, mixed with singing, reading the word and exhortation, from 7 in the evening till 1 in the morning, January 13th, from 10 to 1 in the first part of the day, and from 6 to half past 8 this evening, I visited from house to house the people living in Orange Street, and saw in this way the families living in nine houses, to assert whether any individuals wanted Bibles, whether they could read, whether they wished their children put in our day school or Sunday school, with the view of helping them accordingly. This afforded opportunities to converse with them about their souls. In this way, I sold eight Bibles and two Testaments at reduced prices and gave away one Testament, engaged one woman as an adult scholar, one boy as a day scholar, and spoke besides this to about 30 people about their souls. I should greatly delight in being frequently engaged in such work, for it is the most important one. But our hands are so full with other work that we can do but little in this way. Visit of Mr. A. N. Groves. January 17th. Today, Brother Groves arrived from the East Indies. One reason of his coming to England is to go to Germany to obtain missionary brethren for the East Indies, and he asked me to accompany him, that thus, through me, he may be enabled to judge about the state of the brethren and to communicate to them what he thinks needful for them to know. This is the most important work. May the Lord direct me in this matter and make me to act according to his will. January 28th. I have for these several days again prayed much to ascertain whether the Lord will have me go as a missionary to the East Indies, and I am most willing to go if he will condescend to use me in this way. January 29th. I have been greatly stirred up to pray about going to Calcutta as a missionary. May the Lord guide me in this matter. February 4th. I have been praying repeatedly and earnestly of late respecting my journey to the continent. I desire to go or not to go, just as the Lord will have it to be. May he graciously direct me. I feel the same about going to India. As a means of, to asserting the Lord's will, I have been reading about the Hindus, that I may know more clearly the state in which they are. May the Lord in mercy stir me up to care more about their state, whether it be his will that I should labor personally among them or not. February 16th. I mentioned this evening before the church of Bethsaida, as also on the 13th before the church of Gideon, that I see it the Lord's will to go to the continent for the sake of assisting Brother Groves by my knowledge of the German language in conferring with those who may desire to go out as missionaries. There is not one believer among us who sees any objection to it, and several have said that it seems to be of the Lord, and that thus we could help as churches in the going forth of missionaries. This is very comforting to me, as the Lord confirms me still more through this anonymity in its being his will that I should go. February 25th, in the name of the Lord and in his dependency, upon him alone for support, we have established a fifth day school for poor children, which today has been opened. We have now two boys' schools and three girls' schools. Visit to Germany. February 26th, this afternoon out of Bristol for the continent. March 7th, Dover. Last evening I left London and arrived here this morning. The Lord enabled me to confess him before my fellow passengers. I have had a good deal of prayer and reading the word in quietness, though staying in a hotel. March 8th, I preached this morning and evening comfortably in one of the chapels at Dover. March 9th, all this day we have been obliged to remain at Dover at the sea being so rough that no packet sails. I spent the day in letter writing, in reading the word, and in prayer. We depend entirely upon the Lord as regards our movements. This evening we asked the Lord twice, unitedly, that he would be pleased to calm the wind and the waves, and I now feel quite comfortably in leaving the matter with him. March 10th. The Lord heard our prayers. We awoke this morning and found the wind comparatively slight. We left the hotel before break of day to go to the packet, all being in a great hurry on our way towards the sea. I was separated from brothers G and Y. I now lifted up my heart to the Lord, as he generally helps me to do on such occasions, to direct my steps towards the boat, which went out to meet the packet, and I found it almost immediately. We had an answer to prayer, a good passage. As Calus, we 
uh, obtained our passports, passed the customs, and secured places in the diligence without difficulty, and left a little after ten in the morning for Paris. What a blessing, blessed thing it is in all such matters to have a father to go for help. What a different thing also to travel in the service of the Lord Jesus from what it is to travel in the service of the flesh. March 14th. Brother Groves and I took our places in the Valley Posty for Strasbourg to leave tomorrow evening. Brother Y intends to remain here a few days on account of his house. March 15th. This morning I preached in a little chapel in uh, Palais Royale. We left Paris this evening at 6. March 17th. From 6 o'clock in the evening of the 15th till this afternoon at half past 1. When we arrived at Strasbourg, we were continually shut up in the Mali Posti, with the exception of yesterday morning about 7 and last night about 11, when we were allowed half an hour for our meals. I had refreshing communion with my beloved brother. This quickest of all conveyances in France carries only two passengers, and we were thus able freely to converse and to pray together, which was refreshing indeed. Though we had traveled 44 hours, yet as we had soon finished our business at Strasbourg, we left this evening for Basel, trusting in the Lord for strength for the third night's traveling. A little after we had started, we struck fast to a new road, in a new road. I lifted up my heart to the Lord, and we were soon delivered. Otherwise, the circumstances in a cold night and during a fall of snow would have been trying, as we had to get out of the mail. I now found myself again after six years amongst fellow passengers who spoke my native language, but alas, they spoke not for Christ. A Christian's wife's gracious deportment and its results. March 18th. This afternoon we arrived at Basel, where we were very kindly received by the brother. During my stay there, I attended one day a meeting at which a venerous pious clergyman expounded the Greek New Testament to several brethren, who purposed to give themselves to missionary service. The passage to which this dear aged brother had then come in the original of the New Testament was 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, which in our English translation reads thus, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. After this aged brother had expounded the passage, he related a circumstance which had occurred in his own days and under his own eyes at Basel, which has appeared to me so encouraging for the, those children of God who have unbelieving relatives and especially for sisters of the Lord who have unbelieving husbands, in which at the same time in such a beautiful illustration of 1 Peter 3, 1, that I judge it desirable to insert the narrative of this fact here. I will do so as exactly as I remember it. There lived a Basel, an opulent citizen, whose wife was a believer, but he himself feared not the Lord. His practice was to spend his evenings in a wine house, where he often would tarry until 11, 12, or even 1 o'clock. On such occasions, his wife would always used to send her servants to bed, and sat up herself to await the return of her husband. When at last he came, she used to receive him most kindly, never reproach him in the least, either at the time or afterwards, nor complain at all on account of his late hours, but by which she was kept from seasonable rest. Moreover, if it should be needful to assist him in undressing himself when he had drunk to excess, she would do this also in a very kind and meek way. Thus it went on for a long time. One evening this gentleman was again as usual in the wine house, and having tarried there with his merry companions till midnight, he said to them, I bet that if I go to my house, we shall find my wife sitting up waiting for me. And she herself will come to the door and receive us very kindly. And if I ask her to prepare a supper, she will do it at once without a least murmur or unkind expression or look. His companions in sin did not believe his statement. At last, however, after some more conversation about this strange statement, as it appeared to them, it was agreed that they would go to see his kind wife. Accordingly they went, and after they had knocked, they found the door immediately opened by the lady herself, and they were all courteously and kindly received by her. The party, had, party having entered, the master of the house asked his wife to prepare supper for them, which she, in the meekest way, at once agreed to do. And after a while, supper was served by herself without the least sign of dissatisfaction, murmur, or complaint. Having now prepared all for the company, she retired from the party to her room. When she had left the party, one of the gentlemen said, What a wicked and cruel man you are, thus to torment so kind a wife. He then took his hat and stick, and without touching a morsel of supper, went away. Another made a similar remark and laughed without touching the supper. 
Thus one after another left, till they were all gone without tasting the supper. The master of the house was now left alone, and the Spirit of God brought before him all his dreadful wickedness, and especially his great sin towards his wife. And the party had not left the house half an hour before he went to his wife's room, requesting her to pray for him, told her that he felt himself a great sinner, and asked her forgiveness for all his behavior towards her. From that time he became a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Observe here, dear reader, the following points in particular, which I affectionately commend to your consideration. Number one, the wife acted in accordance with 1 Peter 3, 1. She kept her place as being in subjection, and the Lord owned it. Number two, she reproached not her husband, but meekly and kindly served him when he used to come home. Number three, she did not allow the servants to set up for their master, but sat up herself, thus honoring him as her head and superior, and concealed also, as far as she was able, her husband's shame from the servants. Number four, in all probability, a part of those hours during which she had to set up was spent in prayer for her husband, or in reading the word of God to gather fresh strength for all the trials connected with her position. Number five, be not discouraged if you have to suffer from unconverted relatives. Perhaps, very shortly, the Lord will give you the desire of your heart and answer your prayer for them. But in the meantime, seek to commend the truth, not by reproaching them on account of their behavior towards you, but by manifesting towards them the meekness, gentleness, kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ. March 25th. I arrived yesterday morning at 6 at Schaffenhausen. I found a brother waiting for me at the post office, a gentleman of title, who, having been informed by the brother at Basel, of my arrival, kindly took me to his house for the two hours I had to stay in that town, to refresh my body with breakfast and my soul with communion, with the brother whom he had invited to meet me. This morning, I saw Brother Gundert, the student of divinity, on whose account I am here, and spent about three hours in conversation with him. March 26th. This morning, I drove with Brother Gundert to Stackart, um, Stratikart, both for the sake of seeing more of him and also that we might unitedly talk over the matter with his father who lives there. I am now staying at the house of Brother Gundart Sr., who I am kindly lodged, where I am kindly lodged. I think my brother Gundart Jr. will go to the East Indies. His father is not only willing to give him up for the Lord's sake, but seems to consider it an honor to have a son to give to the Lord in this way. Stays at Halle. March 30th, Hal. From the evening of the 27th till this afternoon, when I arrived here, I traveled day and night and have been strengthened by the Lord for it. My thoughts were particularly affecting as I retraced the memories which I had experienced at the hand of God. The Lord enabled me repeatedly to confess His name before my changing fellow travelers. A student spoke to me about the particularly good and cheap wine at Weinheim near Heldenburg. I told him that when years ago as a student like myself, I came to that place, I cared about such things, but that now I knew what was much better than mine. Yesterday, a Frenchman, having heard my testimony to Jesus once or twice, when the last married companion had left, the coach quit, quitted my society in being too dull for him and joined himself to an officer in the army, setting in the forepart of the coach. The coach was divided into the forepart and inside. This gave me a blessed and most refreshing opportunity to pray for about an hour out loud in the coach, which strengthened and refreshed my soul. It was particularly kind of the Lord to give me an opportunity of praying aloud. I was on account of having then already traveled 48 hours uninterruptedly. My body was too tired to allow me to continue for any length of time in mental prayer. Yesterday afternoon at E-I-S-E-N-A-C-H, situated just under the hill on which stands the decayed castle, called the Wartford, where Luther translated the Holy Scriptures, I saw fearful scenes of profanity. How has the candlestick been removed? This afternoon I reached hell, where it pleased the Lord to bring me to the knowledge of himself, having been graciously preserved hitherto, though a spring was found broken when I got out of the mail. I greatly needed rest, but my heart was too full. I could not sleep. I went first to the house of a brother, where I was first impressed, and afterwards called on my esteemed tutor, Professor Dr. Tholock, counselor of the consistory, who received me after seven years' separation with his formal kindness and brotherly love. He made no lodge with me, and gave thereby a testimony that differences of views concerning certain parts of God's truth ought not to separate the children of men, for I had previously written him my mind, 
March 31st. Today I rode with Dr. Thorlock and his two young brethren to a believing clergyman living in the neighborhood of Hell, where we spent the day. Dr. Thorlock told me many encouraging things, particularly this, that several of my former fellow students who, at the time when I was at Hell, knew not the Lord, had been brought to him since, to know him since, and we are now laboring in his vineyard. And further, that certain brethren, formerly very weak in the faith, had been established and are now going on. April 1st, today I saw a clergyman in whom I recognized an individual who studied at Hale while I was there, living then in open sin, and who is now by divine mercy, pointing sinners to the Lamb of God. In the evening I went to the large orphan house built in dependency on the Lord by A. H. Frankie to see one of the classic classical teachers who is the son of my father's neighbor and whom I had not seen for about 15 years. I found him in the joy of my heart to be a brother in the Lord. This evening I spent in the same room where it pleased the Lord to begin a work of grace in my heart with several of the same brethren and sisters with whom I used to meet seven years ago and tell them of the Lord's faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, and forbearance towards me since I had seen them last. Truly how good has the Lord been to me since. April 2nd, this morning I again spent in calling on the brother and sisters being enabled else everywhere before learning and unlearning to testify about the blessing of adhering to the scriptures as our only guide in spiritual things. I left Hale this afternoon, having received much love from the brother, and drove 15 miles further to a beloved brother and old friend, Brother um, Stas Schmidt, Smith, at Sander Sleepin, who has shown me much kindness ever since I had been in England. I was received with much love by this brother and his dear wife and his manservant, also a beloved brother. April 3rd, um, Sander Slothman. Today I saw several brothers and sisters, and among others, a brother who is about the same state in which he was eight years ago. He has very little enjoyment and makes no progress in the things of God. The reason is that, against his conscience, he remains in a calling which is opposed to the profession of a believer. We are exhorted in Scripture to abide in our calling, but only if we can abide in it with God. 2 Corinthians 7.24 This evening, a believing clergyman and the brethren and sisters of this small town in some neighborhood villages were collected, were collected together in Brother Stahlschmidt's house, and I spoke to them for two hours about the t- things of God, particularly about the way in which God has led me since I saw them and sought to strengthen their hands in God and exhorted them to give themselves fully to the Lord. It was a time of refreshing. Indeed, the Lord greatly refreshed my own soul in every place where I spoke well of his name. This is his father. April 4th. I left Sand in Slothburg this morning. My host acted according to 3 John 5 and 6, for he sent me on 10 miles in his carriage. When I arrived at Ashtashir, it's A-S-C-H-E-R-S-L-E-B-E-N, to which place Brethren Stoffsmith had conveyed me. I had but one station more to my father's house. On the way, I asked the driver about a certain individual with whom I studied at Hale, once a companion with me in open sin. I found that he is still in the same state. What a difference has grace made between him and me? Nothing, nothing but grace has made this difference. I, guilty sinner, might now be still on the same road, and he, in my stead, might have been plucked as a brand out of the fire. But it is not so. May the Lord help me to love him much, very much, for his distinguishing grace. Such feelings I had in particular this afternoon when I saw the town before me in which my father lives, as there are but two in the whole place, as far as I can find out, who love the Lord. How different is everything with me now from what it was when, as a wicked youth, I used to go to this town at the time of my vacation. How truly happy am I now. How is my heart now raised above all these things in which I sought, and also fancied I found happiness. Truly all these things are like uh, bubbles to me now. My heart is not here. Yea, my heart is, is not even in England. My heart is at least in a measure in heaven. Though I am still but a poor, weak worm, I felt the solemnity and importance of having once more the privilege of seeing my aged father. I also felt the importance of being at a place where I had spent 
much of my time in my youth and where I had been known as living in sin. My desire was that I might be enabled to walk in the three days I intended to stay there, as it becomes a servant of Christ. For this, I had been led to pray before I left Bristol, and since I had been on the continent. At last I arrived at my father's house, how affecting to meet him once more. April 5th, Halmer Slavin, H-E-I-M-E-R-S-L-E-B-E-N. This afternoon a friend of my father called, one who knows not the Lord. After a few minutes, the Lord gave me an opportunity of setting before him the fundamental truths of the gospel and the joy and comfort they afford and have afforded to me. Thus a way was opened to me of stating the truth more fully than ever I had been able to do before by word of mouth in the presence of my father and brother without saying to them, Thou art the man. I was assisted by the Lord. May he water the seed sown. April 6th. I had not on this visit spoke directly to my father about the state of his soul, though he has more than ever heard the truth from my lips. God has indeed been with me, and I believe that I have been led by him to pursue this course. Different, however, has been the way in which I have dealt with my unconverted brother, for the relationship in which I stand to him is a different one. For this afternoon, I not only pointed out to him his danger, but spoke also respecting his sins, and have done so in my letters, and intend to do so still, if the Lord permit. I spend this evening in relating to my father and brother some of the Lord's dealings with me in England, particularly how he has graciously provided for my temporal wants in answer to prayer, and they both seem to feel, for the moment at least, the blessedness of such a life. April 7, a part of this morning I spent in walking about with my father to see one of his gardens and some of his fields, because I knew it would give him pleasure, and I felt that I ought in every way to show him kindness and attention, as far as I consciously could. Tomorrow, God willing, I intend to leave and to return to England. The Lord, in his rich mercy, in answer to my prayer, has enabled me so to walk before my father, and has also impressed what I have said so far upon his heart, as to cause him to say today, May God help me to follow your example, and to act according to what you have said to me. Leaves from Bristol, April 9th, Cell, S-C-E-L-L-E. Yesterday morning I drove with my father to Cal's first stat, where with many tears he separated from me. I was alone in the mall in the mail, which was a great comfort to me. It was a solemn time. I found myself again on the road to Brunswick, which I had traversed twice in the service of the devil, and now I was traveling on it in the name of Jesus. I discerned in passing the inn at Wolfenbuttel, from whence I intended to run away and where I was arrested. How peculiar were my feelings. In the evening we reached Brunswick, from whence we started the same night. During the night I heard a fearful, fearfully wicked, most prolific infidel and scoffing conversation between the conductor and a student, and the only testimony I gave was complete silence all the time. I arrived here this morning at 8, and have been here all the morning, as the mail will not start for Hamburg until 4 this afternoon. It has been far from well with me in my soul today. That awful conversation last night has been spiritual poison to me. How very soon to do we, even unconsciously, receive evil. April 10th, Hamburg. I arrived here at 10 this morning. April 15th, Bristol. Yesterday at 1, we landed in London. In answer to prayer, I soon obtained my things from the custom house and reached my friends in Chancery Lane a little after two, where I found a letter from my wife stating that Brother Craig is ill with inflammation in the wing pipe and therefore, humanly speaking, will be unable to preach for some time. In consequence of this, I started immediately for Bristol and arrived this morning. I found Brother Craig better than I had expected, though completely unable to attend to the ministry of the Word. May 5th, my father-in-law has been for several days very, been very ill. June 3rd, today we had a public meeting on account of the Scriptural Knowledge Institution for Home and Abroad. It was now 15 months since in the dependency upon the Lord for the supply of means. We have been enabled to provide poor children with schooling, circulate the Holy Scriptures, and aid missionary labors. During this time, though the field of labor has been continually enlarged, and though we have now and then been brought low in funds, the Lord has never allowed us to be obliged to stop the work. 
We have been enabled during this time to establish three day schools and to connect with the institution to other charity day schools, which, humanly speaking, otherwise would have been closed for wanted means. The number of children that have been thus provided with schooling amounts to 439. June 20th. Our father is evidently today near his end. June 22nd. This morning at 2, our father died. June 23rd. Both our children are ill. June 24th. Our little boy is very ill. June 25th. The dear little boy is so ill that I have no hope of his recovery. The disease is inflammation in the chest. I spoke this evening comfortably at Gideon. On Psalms 145, verses 1 through 4, thinking it right that neither the death of my father-in-law nor my dying child should keep me from the Lord's work. The Lord's holy will be done concerning the dear little one. June 26, my prayer last evening was that God would be pleased to support my dear wife under the trial, should he remove the little one, and to take him soon to himself, thus sparing him from suffering. I did not pray for the child's recovery. It was about two hours after that that the dear one went home. June 27th, my dear wife is graciously supported. May the Lord grant that these afflictions may not be lost upon us. June 28th, I preached today both times comfortably. June 29th, this morning was the funeral. The remains of our father and infant were put into the same grave. July 3rd, our taxes are due. It may be called for any day. And for the first time we have no money to pay them as we were obliged, on account of our late afflictions, to spend the money which we had put by for them. May the Lord in his mercy provide. June 6. I was enabled today by the free will offering through the boxes and by what I had left to pay the taxes before they were called for. How kind of the Lord to answer my prayer so soon. July 8. This evening I spent five pounds sent from Weston Suppermare. So the Lord has again appeared. May I praise his holy name for this seasonable help, which came when I had scarcely any money left. July 14th. Today I had again a suit of new clothes given to me by a brother. My clothes were much worn and old, and our late funeral might have given a second reason for having new ones. But I did not order any, because I had no money to pay for them, and I thought it was wrong to con- contract debts. A fresh paper was brought today, was brought in today for taxes, which ought to have been asked for many months since. May the Lord give us the means to pay them. July 22nd. The last months in taxes were called for this morning, just after the Lord had sent us five pounds from a distance of about 80 miles. So the Lord has again of late repeatedly in answer to prayer sent help. May this lead us to trust in Him for the future. Illness. August 15th. Today, dear brother Craig returned from Devonshire, much better in his general health, but not as regards his voice. August 24th. I feel very weak and suffer more than ever before. I am in doubt whether to leave Bristol entirely for a time. I have no money to go away for a change of air. I have had an invitation to stay for a week with a sister in the country, and I think of accepting the invitation and going tomorrow, August 26th. Today I had given, I had five pounds given to me for the express purpose of getting a change of air. August 29th. Today I received another five pounds for the same purpose. August 30th, today, for the first Lord's Day since our arrival in Bristol, I have been kept from preaching through illness. How mercifully the Lord dealt in giving me so much strength for these years. I had another five pounds sent to aid me in procuring change of air. How kind is the Lord in thus providing me with the means of leaving Bristol. September 2nd, went with my family to Portistad. September 3rd to the 5th. I read the lives of the English martyrs at the time of the Reformation. My spirit has been greatly refreshed. May the Lord help me to follow these holy men as far as they followed Christ. Of all reading, besides that of the Holy Scriptures, which should be always the book, the chief book to us, not merely in theory, but also in practice, such like books seems to me the most useful for the growth of the inner man. Yet one has to be cautious in the choice and to guard against reading too much. September 14th, we are still at Portistahed. I am but little better. I am greatly bowed down today on account of my inward corruptions and carnality of heart. When will God deliver me from this state? How I long to be more like him. My present way of living is also a great trial to me. The caring so much about the body and the having for my chief employment, eating and drinking, walking, bathing, taking horse exercise, all this, to which I have not been at all accustomed, 
these six years, I find to be very trying. I would much rather be again in the midst of the work in Bristol, if my Lord will condescend to use his most unworthy servant. September 15th, as I clearly understood that the person who lets me his horse has no license, I saw that being bound as a believer to act according to the laws of the country, I could not use it no longer. And as the horse exercise seems most important, humanly speaking, for my restoration, and that this is the only horse which is to be had in the place, we came to the conclusion to leave Portis Head today. Immediately after, I received a kind letter from a brother and two sisters in the Lord, who live in the Isle of Wight, to go and stay with them for some time. This matter has been today a subject for prayer and consideration. September 16th, we came this morning to the conclusion to leave Portis Head today, and that I should go to the Isle of Wight. But we saw not how my wife and child and their servant could accompany me, as we had not sufficient money for traveling expenses. The Lord graciously removed the difficulty this evening, for we received most unexpectedly and unasked for six pounds thirteen shillings, which was owed to us, and also a letter containing two pounds. How very, very kind and tender is the Lord. September 19th, this evening we arrived at the Alarite. September 27th, today I am thirty years of age. I feel myself an unprofitable servant. How much more might I have lived for God than I have done? May the Lord grant that, if I am allowed to stay a few days more in this world, they may be spent entirely for him. September 29th, last evening when I retired from the family, I had a desire to go to rest at once, for I had prayed a short while before, and feeling weak in body, the coldness of the night was a temptation for me to pray no further. However, the Lord did help me to fall upon my knees, and no sooner had I commenced praying than he shone into my soul and gave me such a spirit of prayer as I had not enjoyed for many weeks. He graciously once more revived his work in my heart. I enjoyed that nearness to God and fervency in prayer for more than an hour for which my soul had been panting for many weeks past. For the first time during this illness I could ask the Lord earnestly to restore me again, which had not been the case before. I now long to go back again to the work in Bristol, yet without impatience, and feel assured that the Lord will strengthen me to return to it. I went to bed especially happy and awoke this morning in great peace rose sooner than usual, and had again real communion with the Lord before breakfast. May he in his mercy continue the state of heart to his most unworthy child. October 9th. I had many times had thought of giving in print some account of the Lord's goodness to me for the instruction, comfort, and encouragement of the children of God. And I have been more than ever stirred up to do so since I read Newton's life a few days ago. I have considered today all the reasons for and against, and find that there are scarcely any against, and many for it. October 15th, today we left for Bristol. November 18th, this evening 30 pounds was given to me, 25 for the Scriptural Knowledge Institution, and 5 pounds for myself. This is a most remarkable answer to prayer.